All right, very good. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. And obviously, again, we're talking about Christianity, the church, and nationalism. So, Pastor Mike, I'm going to ask if you would uh, start us off by helping us to understand what is nationalism. Before we get in this conversation, let's go ahead and define what we mean by nationalism. Um, that's a great question. So, as you might imagine, there's a lot of people who are kind of seeking to, to define this. And essentially, no matter where you look for a definition, there are two common characteristics or traits that most people who are going to try to define nationalism are going to kind of highlight. So national, nationalism is the pursuit of trying to get your nation to uh, be in a place where it has an advantage. And typically that means an advantage over and above other nations. It's either that or it's the pursuit for sovereignty. So those are the two ways we understand nationalism. Nationalism is about uh, a nation's uh, pursuit of independence like, like this country uh, once did, or it's the pursuit of kind of a, you might say, being one up um, on another nation and having an advantage. As I was looking at this stuff and, and studying for this, you know, it says identification with one's own nation and support for its interests, especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. So, it's like the Olymp it, it views it more of an Olympics, like you have all these nations and to be, to be involved in nationalism means you want your nation to get the gold medal. You wanna be the best. Uh, your nation has to be first. Um, and then sometimes nationalism is associated with people groups who are trying to form their own nation and become sovereign. Many of you may not know this, but in Spain, there has been an ongoing discussion and some activity uh, for the Catalonians uh, to become their own sovereign nation, right? And uh, that's where like Mess Leo, Leo Messi plays, Barcelona, there's a whole group of people, eth ethnic group of people trying to do that, trying to get their own sovereignty. So that's how I would understand nationalism, the pursuit of, of the interest of the nation, uh, even if it means other nations are put at a disadvantage. And particularly to make your make sure to ensure that your nation has an advantage over and above other nations. All right, Pastor Mike, we know that nationalism is not new. Uh, it didn't just come up, uh, but for some reason, the conversations regarding nationalism seem to have increased, increased greatly over the last few years. Uh, why is that? Why do you think that that has uh, become such a popular subject for us in the last few years? Well, I think no doubt about it, it has a lot to do with um, the election of President Trump. And I think there were some things that were preceded that, that if you did a little historical work, you could see um, how that came about. I think there was a, there's been a growing sentiment in our country uh, of concern about our nation, concern about our nation's future, concern about what's best for our nation. And Running alongside of that, there's been this movement of, we don't need to be so concerned about our nation, so nationalistic. We need to be more focused on individuals and ethnic groups and people groups and certain communities within our nation. So there, there was a silent and not sometimes not so silent um, debate that was happening both public and on social media Po politically and non-politically between, is this about us as a nation, what's best for our nation? Or is this, does the, does the United States exist to make sure that all these individuals have all their little things and all that kind of stuff? And so, of course, those who are more concerned with more of a nationalism approach are gonna feel uh, in some ways threatened, some ways that that's putting our nation at risk. I think that was there long before and I think as a general rule, what I mean by general rule is general rule. I always got that from uh, the old Michael Jordan documentary when Michael came back and um, they were talking on the bench, do you think Michael's gonna start? And uh, I think it was Jed Bushler or 
Steve Kerr, who said, as a general rule, when your statue is outside of the stadium, you don't come off the bench. <laughs> so as a general rule, uh, when it comes to this, politically speaking, people who have more of a liberal political bent are less concerned about nationalism. People who have more of a conservative bent are more concerned about nationalism. In other words, Democrats team, tend to be less concerned about the heights of nationalism. It doesn't mean they don't care about uh, America, but it just not so much as the win, whereas it tends, tends to be almost divided down the line. Um, so what I'm saying is historically, that's been a growing concern. Also, where does it come from? It's kind of in our DNA. Uh, as a country, and a lot of people get sick of me saying this whenever we have these kind of conversations, but it's true. Um, this is very American because we were a colony of England and we rebelled. <laughs> whatever you read in your history books is whatever. The truth is we were a colony. We were part of a nation. And for a lot of reasons, we decided we didn't want to do that. And we wanted to be our own sovereign state. Nationalism was birthed. So America is a nas has nationalism in its DNA. If you look at all of our, um, our documents, our founding documents, our constitution, there's a lot of strong national sovereignty, the flag, the whole thing. And America's relatively new as a nation, hundreds of years old. So, so Jeremy, we have a history of nationalism, strong nationalism. Uh, you know, when we fought wars, it's been propagated throughout time, you know, um, I mean, when, when, when presidents on both sides of the aisle stand up in front of the American people and say, and I quote, America is the light of the world, that's nationalism. <laughs> America is the light of the world, that's nationalism. That's like, we're the light, we're the best. We, 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 we're the peacekeepers, we're this, we're that. That's nationalism, that's, that's a great pride. Um, so it's always been there, but I think the, the, as everyone knows, probably who's on this call, that there has been a resurgence in kind of a concern over that, as well as a concern about the direction of our country. And I think the election of President Trump brought that to a highlight when he said, let's make America great again. That's a classic nationalistic line, right? Make America great again is a classic nationalistic line. And so I think that's kind of stirred it up. And then whatever gets stirred up in Washington and across the political lines leaks into the rest of society, leaks into churches and leaks in schools and social media. And so um, then you have the, the, the elections now, and now it's at the forefront and it's a big deal. But all that to say is this has been in our DNA since its inception. Thank you, Pastor Mike. I want to ask you this question. Um, some folks identify themselves as simply patriotic, not necessarily nationalist, but patriotic. How would you distinguish nationalism and patriotism? So, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I would I think that uh, there's a lot of articles out there that if you read them, so you know I'm a political studies major, and if you read them, um, there's a they would say there's a lot of um, kind of intersection between those continuity and discontinuity, we might call it. There's continuity between the Old and New Testament and there's discontinuity between the Old and New Testament. So um, nationalism really speaks to the whole, whereas patriotism speaks to the individual. So you can, this is another way to say it. You can't have nationalism without patriotism because patriotism is the act wherein an individual prizes their nation enough to want their nation to be X, Y, Z, and they're willing to do what it takes to make their nation X, Y, Z. So you can't have nationalism without patriotism. You need patriots, people who are devoted to the, and support the country. And so patriotism, I think, is like the, the support system for nationalism. You got to have people who are devoted to it, who are sold out, who are supportive, who are like, yep, I'm all in on America, or I'm all in on Iraq, or I'm all in on China, or I'm all in on Sudan, I'm all in on my nation of Bolivia, or wherever it is, of Kenya, I'm all in on my nation, 
as a patriot, as an individual, and I believe in the national um, vision for that. But you can tell there is some, some overlap there. But I think one is more of a corporate perspective, nationalism as a whole, and one is an individual. Um, you'll often hear, he was a patriot. She was a true patriot, right? And for those of you who are out there who there may be one or two people on this call, I'm not sure who are fans of the Patriots. Um, you, you're not happy right now. And you're especially not happy that Tom Brady's winning right now. He is beating the, uh, the Packers. And I bet that they would lose by two touchdowns. So Brady's looking me in the eye every time he looks in the camera too. Like, don't you doubt me. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, we can leave some more time to talk about football, man. I've got a few more questions for you. I really appreciate that. Um, Pastor Mike, let's talk about um, – you, you, you mentioned a few moments ago that, you know, it, within nationalism you have these idea of these specific groups. Can we just talk about Christian nationalism for a moment since this is uh, Christianity, the church, and, the na and nationalism? Let's talk about this idea of Christian nationalism a little bit. Okay, so there's Christian nationalism as most people know it, and then I would actually go so far as to say there is a biblical notion of Christian nationalism, but they are very, very different. They aren't even close to each other. So Christian nationalism is basically the idea that America, we're just going to pick on America, not that America is the only place that experiences this, but we're going to pick on America because we're in America is the idea that um, America is a Christian nation. It was founded by Christians. It's founded on Christian principles. And um, it's, I think it's fair to say this, it's basically the national version of the church, which is why people will fly the American flag at their church and 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 knowing the laws, it has to be over other flags and why they have like a, Patriot Day at the church and, and those types of things. Um, and also, it's the idea that um, our Christianity is extremely intertwined and dependent on the nation and the nation on the Christianity. In other words, there's not any differentiation to be a Christian is to be an American, to be an American is to be a Christian. They're intertwined. They don't, they don't tend to see a lot of differentiation. I mean, it is what it is, right? Um, and obviously, uh, I mean, there's so much history in this. We don't have time to go into all the history, but there's tons of stuff that you could read and you can see this, that this was something that was pretty much, in my opinion, um, the founders plan this whole thing. And I'm not talking about conspiracy. It wasn't conspiracy. They planned it. Um, they didn't plan the whole Christian thing, but they did plan the God thing. And you know that because the founding documents all have God in them. And they're very entwined, like those famous words that uh, all men are created equal, all men are created equal, and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's brilliant uh, because what it basically does is it says, look, these rights that we're talking about, these rights that we're influencing, uh, that we're, we're telling you about, we're writing in the constitution, they come from God. God gave them, God gave you these things. And so as we're building this nation and constructing these laws, these laws are God's laws. They come from God. So it's intertwined. And so it's been said throughout history, the best way to sell something to people is to attach God to it and, and, and enmesh God into it. And they were brilliant in that, in that sense, that they were like, no. And people on this call and other where may debate how Christian were they and all those types of things. And that's not the debate tonight, Jeremy. The, the issue is Christian nationalism. I'm just saying America, as I said before, it not only had nationalism, but it had Christianity baked in in its birth, in its exception. And there were a lot of real Christians and nominal Christians and deist 
God people and a few secularists and atheists all matched in. And so that's, that's how, so Christian nationalism is old, 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 old. You know, it talks about in the Civil War, you could have pastors on both sides praying and preaching. The North had pastors, the South had pastors. And if you're reformed, the South had all the revivals and all the godliness and the Calvinism and the real gospel. And the North were all liberals and had all the Armenians. And, you know, the whole story goes on. But here you have it. It's baked in. I mean, here's dudes on the battlefield, and they both have evangelists and pastors and priests praying for them. And this is not just in America. It's all around. So Christian nationalism, the idea is that, hey, uh, our nation's Christians, Christians are Americans, Americans are Christians, it's all baked in. Christian nationalism biblically is a whole nother creature uh, because there is an idea of Christian nationalism, and uh, I won't go too deep into this, but just for reference. Uh, actually, Pastor Mike, go ahead and go as deep as you want because that was one of my next questions I was going to follow up with. So go as okay. deep as you want in that uh, uh, example. So it is interesting that... Um, when people get saved, the New Testament tells them who they are and their new identity. And according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a, a, a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, um, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And he begins to talk about all this stuff. And one of the ways he ends this um, um, kind of commentary of who we really are, in verse 9 he says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's interesting. Now, when we think holy, we think, no fornication, don't lie, but holy simply means to be set apart. So the Bible is very clear that when someone becomes a Christian, they get out of the kingdom of darkness, they come into the kingdom of light. But one of the ways that the uh, analogies that scripture uses is a nation, right? We become, an, we're part of a nation. So it's using that idea of the nations. And you know, the Bible talks about the nations, their, their identifiable boundaries. But Christianity transcends the nations, and as people get saved, they become part of the holy nation, the set-apart nation. And they become part of that holy nation by grace, through faith, in Christ alone, right? And his life, his righteous life, his virgin birth, his righteous life, his, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. So we do have an idea of Christian nationalism, but it is nothing like what it's generally promoted to be. And by the way, again, um, the, uh, Paul uses this phrase, um, for our citizenship is in heaven. <laughs> in other words, the New Testament writers, when talking to Christians, would use terminology commonly associated with belonging to a physical, geographical, ethnical nation and co-opt the terms and say, no, this is what it means for you now that you're in the family of God. So your citizenship is in heaven. You're a holy nation. So there is a concept of a Christian nation and Christian nationalism, but it's more along the lines when Jesus said, um, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my servants would be fighting. It's a different type of a kingdom made up of a different type of people with different types of ethics and values. Uh, that's what it's about. They're in the world, but they're not of the world. Uh, they're very set apart from this world, right? Um, and they live very differently. Like, they're very different. They're aliens and strangers, Peter says. Right? We're, we're salt and light. America's not salt and light. America's not the light of the world. That's Christian nationalism. That's idolatry. That's demonic. When you say America is the light of the world, that's demonic. Jesus is the light of the world. <laughs> the church is the light of the world. A nation's not the light of the world. Never has been, never will be. Okay? 
So there is an idea of Christian nationalism, but it's so different. And most people are so ignorant of it. Um, it, it pains me to say this, that it's like, it's usually when we're talking about Christian nationalism, we're talking about the enmeshment of Christianity with, with um, the nation of America, let's just pick on America, that where it becomes so enmeshed that Christianity and Americanism are indistinguishable. Indistinguishable. You cannot tell. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Pastor Mike, what about what we saw with Israel in the Old Testament? Where would you put them on the scale of uh, national? Obviously, it wouldn't have been Christian nationalism. Uh, maybe we might say uh, Jewish nationalism or just nationalism. Where, where would you put them in this gradient of nationalism? Great question. So it is interesting. And um, uh, let me just, I'm just going to read this text because a lot of time we get in this, this um, conversation, um, some people will go here and say, no, there is a Bible doctrine of, of nationalism. Um, so uh, Galatians 3.8, scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. Quote, this is an Old Testament quote, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The argument of the scripture is anybody can be a Jew. We're very Americanized, so we think Jew, uh, Jews are white and whites are Jews and Jews are just other kinds of white people. Um, but when you do a little homework and a little research, you realize that there's all different types of Jews. <laughs> there's Jews that are in Africa and there's Asiatic Jews and there's Serbian Jews. And I mean, they're, they're, they're all, and the vision that God gave to Abraham was that he would be, he would be a mighty nation. Not ethnically, but by faith. All nations will be blessed through you. Huh. How's that going to happen if he's in a Jewish line? Is everyone going to be Jewish? Is, or is God going to kill off all the other nations and there's only going to be Jews and they'll all be saved? No. Through you. Oh, that means through your son and 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 your son and, your son and, your son and the prep and the proper, uh, propagation of the doctrine of faith in God that culminates in the gospel, now all the nations can be blessed. So it's very clear from the biblical standpoint that this, again, the idea was never that you'd have this nation in which um, that was kind of inculcated and that would have no impact on the world whatsoever. And they would just be this kind of club right there. Um, because because Jews were supposed to be the light of the world. That's very clear from the prophets. They didn't do that. But what's interesting, Pastor Jeremy, is then when you see this develop, especially like in the New Testament, and um, we were just studying in this today at a church. Um, you remember Paul said in Acts 10, 28, when he was in front of the Gentiles, he says, all of you guys know that it is unlawful for a Jew to visit a Gentile. <laughs> it's like, that's nationalism at its core. And when you read the gospel, you see that the gospel's plural. You see that Jesus had to confront nationalism on all sides. Rome, whose image is this? Caesar's. Then render what is to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. He had to confront it. Should we pay taxes? I mean, what, I mean, what do we do here, right? Um, but he also had to confront Jewish nationalism, right? Remember the woman at the well? Our fathers, our fathers, our fathers, but your people say. So there's clear national, nationalism going on. Um, but what does Jesus do? He transcends that, and he calls people to faith in him. And so what I'm saying is the Jewish nation did what most nations do. They took their ethnic, ethnicity and their national sovereignty, and they exaggerated it. 
That's what all nations do. And by the way, that's usually the first signs that they're on their way to die. No nation in the history of the world has ever exaggerated itself and become extremely nationalistic has survived. The downfall is easy. Look at Nazi Germany. Hitler co-ops Germany, makes it the epicenter of nationalism, and they're dead in 10 years, right? Because it leads to all kinds of wickedness to which the world usually responds and stomps you out. So the point being is, yes, the Jews were considered a nation, uh, but in the biblical sense of a nation, they were supposed to be a nation where people could find God. My house should be a house of prayer for what? All the nations. Well, when was that said? That wasn't said in like 2020, right? That was said thousands of years ago, pre-Christ, right? And so the idea of the Jewish nation was to be a nation that reached out to the nations, that included the nations, and taught the nations about God. Um, but what happens with many nations is they become really obsessed with their own prosperity, with being the best, with taking advantage, and they get exaggerated, even to the point to where they're willing to disobey God, add commandments that aren't in there, and do all those types of things. Uh, but that's a great question. By the way, let me just add this, because someone can conclude, oh, so God doesn't really, he's not into national like stuff and boundaries and borders. Actually, he is. Uh, now, I would say this. Originally, I think before the fall, I don't think um, this, obviously, this none of this would have been an issue because there wouldn't have been a sin in the world, right? But I do think national borders, um, you know, Tower of Babel, Babel and stuff like that, um, play a big part in this. But it is pretty clear um, that from the rest of Scripture, that God is in the nations, a revelation, uh, you know, the nations are going to be there. Uh, Acts 17, 26, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this, here's the point, so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. God formed nations so that they would seek him and reach out for him. God didn't form nations so that they would be the best of nations, so that they would conquer other nations, so that they would abuse and, and rip through people and be number one and be the gods of the nations. That's not why he made the nations. So we can get very distorted. So God doesn't have war with nations. Uh, it's just that when nations get exaggerated, that, that, that becomes a problem. And it is it is natural for nations to be exaggerated. Most nations can't withstand the temptation to become nationalistic in an exaggerated, simple way. Pastor Mike, you talked about nationalism in this exaggerated way and then sometimes even in a diminished way, right? And so my question to you is, um, when it comes to nationalism, man, is there any good usage for it at all? Uh, is there any positive that comes out of it at all? Is there anything in the Bible that would support or lend itself to that being the way to go if it's done this way or done that way at all? Can you think of anything? Well, sure. I mean, um, Jesus paid taxes. And sometimes we, we really don't really think about that, like what it meant. Because, you know, we've had, we have, there's some Christians, there are a few, but there's some Christians who believe we shouldn't pay taxes because the people who are taxing us are not godly and they don't tax us right. And then they use the tax money for wicked purposes. And I'm pretty sure that the taxes Jesus paid was not going to fund synagogues and raising up priests and buying clothes for the poor and those types of things. <laughs> um, so Jesus is the, always the ultimate example that he was a good citizen in a nation right? He was subject to the nation of Rome. He was an ethnically citizen of the Jewish nation, right? He was a Jew. He said he was a Jew, and we believe he was, he was he, you know, we know he was Jewish. Um, and then the rest of the Bible, I mean, we could look all, all over the place, you know? He, you know, the book of Daniel is a great example of the Jewish, Jewish people being subject to Babylon and, and going as far as they can to be good citizens without violating the word of God, right? That, what, 
Oh, you want us to eat food that God said we can't eat? We can't do that, but we can do everything else. Oh, you want me to bow down to this idol in the statue? I can't do that. You know, you want me not to pray? Well, I, I can't do that either. Uh, but other things I could do. I can be a good citizen. And uh, of course, the, the verse in, in uh, the verses in, in Jeremiah where he says, you know, build your houses and have families and seek the welfare of the city. No problem with that. So someone can be nationalistic in the sense that they can say, hey, uh, I love my country. I want the best for my country. I'm going to try to be the best citizen for my country. I'm going to be a Christian uh, first, and uh, my patriotism will be defined and, and kind of confined uh, and commanded by, by Jesus, not the other way around. And uh, so I'm going to be as good citizen as possible. Um, but when the state and or my nation asked me to uh, operate or behave or believe or to feel in ways that are contrary to the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ, then I have to disobey. Acts chapter five. Stop preaching. Can't do that. Right. Can't do that. Uh, Micaiah's day. Right. Only say what the king wants. Can't do that. So there's definitely a role for citizens uh, to play, uh, Christians to play and to support their country and to be pro-country. Now, I will say this, and some people will disagree with this. I don't believe there's anywhere in the Bible where you'll find where we're commanded to be pro-country. We're not, actually, commanded. We're not. There's a difference. So um, people can say, well, how, how do you do that? It's like, well, yeah, I mean, some people want to, some people would kind of be Americans like it's like their sports team, like they want to wear the American jersey. And again, it's, it's our country's the best. And I think that's an area of Christian liberty. And for some people, that's not an area of Christian liberty. For some people, it's like you should never wear the American jersey and you shouldn't support it. And then for other people is that you should support it. And if you don't, you're not Christian, right? And both of those, I think, are a violation of Christian liberty. So God gives us the free choice um, to do that, but we're supposed to be really, really good citizens. And I think Christians should be the best citizens in our country that we have. Thank you for that, Pastor Mike. Um, now, you, you talked earlier about nationalism and you when you were talking earlier, you kind of gave us some examples against nationalism, but we used reasoning to get there. Uh, when we think about this idea of national, are, are there any places in the Bible where, I mean, it's just prohibited, just outright prohibited? So, uh, no, explicitly, no, there, there's no places. Uh, but it is, but it is a lot clearer than some, uh, like um, homeschooling and public versus private schooling in the sense that we have a lot more examples in the Bible of you might say nationalism. So I think Babylon, uh, the book of Daniel and, and Babylon as a nation is a great example of nationalism. If nationalism is promoting the welfare of your nation, even to the point to where others are put at a disadvantage so that you can have an advantage, Babylon. And we could list a whole bunch of other nations to fit that, but Babylon's really clear, really clear. Conquering nations, subjugating people, enslaving people, oppressing people, marginalizing people, and then telling people, this is what we eat, this is how we worship, this is what we do, you're now Babylonian, you're going to do it. And if you don't, you're not seeking our best interests, we're gonna kill you. That's a great example of the embodiment of what it means to, to be nationalism in that sense. And what we find is, is we find Christians are believers in that setting, complying up until the point it's a violation of the law of God. And so, um, and then, like I said, I think, uh, so there's no direct, right? So, but when a nation says, hey, I want you to do something that contradicts the word of God, uh, then we have to, to say no. But there's no, there's no verse in the Bible that says you can't be nationalistic. You can't love your nation and I mean, we're supposed to pray for our nation, we're supposed to pray for our leaders, we should pay our taxes, we should owe no one anything, we should be upstanding, we shouldn't let people speak evil of us because we're evil, we should do good, we should be great citizens. And in that sense, patriots, in that sense, 
Um, but as it is with everything, um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for those things to get exaggerated and become idols. And idolatry is simple when it comes to that. It's just that when the nation becomes more important than God and you're willing to violate God's word for the sake of the nation, then it's an idol. All right, good. Thank you so much for that clarification, Pastor Mike. We're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and go to the chat because we do have a question in the chat. Just want to remind everybody on, if you have a question for Pastor Mike, please go ahead and type that in the chat. You can send it to everyone. You can send it to me privately, and we will make sure that we get that answered uh, the best that we can. Pastor Mike, question comes from our brother Jonathan. He says, if Christian nationalism conflates Christianity and being American, what has been given up? In other words, what should be Christian distinctives in our American society? That's a really big question. Um, so, okay, so let's, let's talk about this. Uh, let me try to approach this from um, the, the latter end, the, the, um, the, the giving up and the distinctive. So the Great Commission, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of what? All the nations, <laughs> okay? Uh, and uh, baptize them and teach them to obey me and I'll be with you always. See, Christianity has a transcendence that uh, I think you might say conflated Christian nationalism doesn't. Uh, conflated Christian nationalism is predominantly concerned with its own interest, okay? That's a, that could, that's a violation of the Great Commission. It's also a violation of the gospel, right? It's also a violation of the second great commandment, love your neighbors yourself, right? It also goes against the Jesus Creed, which basically says that's reverse engineering of human ethics, where we're taught that other people are more important than, our, than us. So those are simple ways in which we can get definitely conflate it and lose that distinctive and what it can ultimately end up with. And this is what always happens. Always. At some point you have to identify who the we of the Christian nationalism are. And isn't it interesting that most of the time you end up with a monolithic, monolithic ethnic group. You understand what I'm saying? So once you say, to his point, if Christian nationalism conflates Christianity and being American, what has been given up? The nations. That's what's given up. Because inevitably, it's going to be really hard to get people from all these different backgrounds to agree that this one nation is it. Because I'm from Bolivia, I'm from Kenya, I'm from Russia, I'm from this and yeah, I might think America as a country, as opportunities and with its freedom is I'd rather live here and circumstantially, right? Yeah, I'd rather be here. But if you're saying that therefore, and you start making all these deductions that they're less than and we have the right to and yada, 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 and we probably shouldn't be as loving towards and all. See, now you're going to be giving up some Christian distinctives that are really clear. Uh, missiology in the Bible is based on the fact that there is no best nation. Everybody needs the gospel. And, and here's another thing in which we give up. Romans 3.23, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Sometimes I hear Christian nationalists speak, and it's like America doesn't have any sin. I mean, they talk about how great America is and we're the great, you know, you hear me say, this is the greatest nation on God's degree. We've had, we've had presidents on both sides say, this is the greatest nation the earth has ever seen. Wow. Okay. All right. And then you start thinking about, unless you were indigenous Indian, African-American, Japanese in the 40s, Korean in the 50s, women all the way up probably to the 2000s. Like, you know, now we're just picking and choosing what we're sweeping under the rug. There are, there's no such thing as a righteous nation. Everybody sinned. When you get collect millions of sinners and put them in a nation, you end up with millions of sinners who knew God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and patience 
and intervention than only the gospel. And, and so we lose our missiology is what happens. So now we, we naturally assume well, we're Christians, we're a Christian nation. So what does that mean? We don't want Muslims in our country. Really? That's interesting because in Acts chapter 2, all these nations came to Jerusalem, all different types of nations, Jews for the celebration, but they weren't all Jews. Some of them were seculars and pagans, and God chose that opportunity in human history to birth his church with all those nations there. And the end of the story says uh, there's going to be a, a number which nobody can count from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So to Jonathan's point, we lose our missiology, right? And, and our missiology, I'll say this last thing, our missiology ceases to be rooted in soteriology in the gospel, which is people need repentance and faith in the gospel to be right with God, to we need to go to other countries and make them like America. <laughs> As it happens. And if they're not like America, they're not good. And when you start measuring like that, it can get very, very dangerous. So missiology, the person of God, loving one another, we lose a lot. Um, and, and, and we cease to be salt and light. Um, people know religion and nationality combined because they see it all over the world. When they see real Christians, they see how they can transcend cultures. And that's pretty rare. Great question. Pastor Mike, let me ask you a question. Uh, and again, want to encourage everyone as we uh, prepare to uh, come to a close. If you have any other questions for Pastor Mike, please go ahead and feel free to type those in the chat. Again, you can type them to me. You, uh, you can type them to everyone. Uh, however, whatever is more comfortable for you, we keep it anonymous. But we're going to get ready to um, bring this to a close. So if you want to get a question in for Pastor Mike, please make sure you go ahead and type your question in the chat so we can get that answer. Pastor Mike, we know that unity um, doesn't mean uniformity. Okay. So uh, my question to you is how do we keep, uh, well, let me ask it like this first and then I'll rephrase it. How do we keep nationalism from dividing our church said another way? Uh, is it possible to have nationalism or how do we maintain a sense of unity, uh, when, um, we have, uh, uh nationalists, Christian nationalists and other types of nationalists within the church? So, uh, I'm going to give you all the answers you guys don't like first. Then I'm going to give you the I the, the the answer I'm supposed to give you. That's why we signed on. That's why we signed on to hear the ones we yeah, don't like. Yeah, you 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 can't do it. We're too sinful, <laughs> not in this age. One of the reasons. So, if you want that, you have to have a monolithic church. Everybody's from the same background, same ethnicity, vote the same, think the same. Monolithic churches don't have these issues, whether they're Asian, black, white, Hispanic. If they're monolithic, they don't tend to wrestle with these issues. You go down to Highland Town and you visit a Hispanic church, they're not typically having big issues on nationalism because what nationalism means to many people who are Hispanic it means something completely different than to a white person. Because <laughs> nationalism to someone who's Hispanic usually means I'm in danger of losing my green card or getting kicked out of the country because I don't have it yet and I'm here illegally. It means something totally different. But if everybody's in that, in that position, you're not, you're not even talking about that. You don't want to talk about no nationalism. You understand what I'm saying? If you're, if you're in an African American setting, nationalism may mean something different because nationalism historically has always meant historically the persecution and subjugation and oppression of African Americans. It so if you want unity around nationalism, be in a monolithic church. If you go to a church like Freedom, Windsor, Mail, and Hazelwood, or you go to a church that is multi-ethnic, there's no such thing as multicultural, but I'll just make people happy. Um, multicultural, multi-ethnic, you're not going to have unity you're, because you have people from different perspectives and the lens through which they see nationalism is very different. Very different. Okay. Um, 
But the last thing I'd say on this is that um, I think we all need to take a step back and ask ourselves, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Isn't it interesting? He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. He didn't say, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and be a patriot. He didn't say, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and all you people who are going to have the amazing privilege to being Americans. Boy, you better just, just praise God because that's the best nation that's ever been on the face of the earth. And boy, you know, kingdom of God's come. He didn't say that. Listen to what he said. Love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which only you can do. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. That's Romans 13 and 1 Corinthians 13 stuff, right? So basically, the solution to that, Jeremy, is, yeah, um, when nationalism gets in the way of you loving your neighbors yourself, nationalism is an idol. Nationalism should never divide us. It shouldn't. Okay. You love America on a scale of one to 10. You're an eight. I'm a five. Do you condemn me because I'm a five? And do I condemn you because you're an eight? What are we talking about? Like, really, what are we talking about? Are we talking about loving God with all our hearts and mind and strength? No. Are we talking about loving our neighbors? No. Are we talking about Jesus as God? No. Salvation by faith alone? No. Are we talking about baptizing people? No. Are we talking about reaching the lost? No. Are we talking about doing the work of the Good Samaritan? No. Are we talking about prayer? No. Sharing the gospel? No. Planting churches? No. Are we talking about loving our wives? No. We're talking about raising our children in godly ways? No. What are we talking about again? Something that God never even commanded? And we want to condemn and judge one another and divide the body over it, we lost our minds. But again, we're Americans. And you guys have heard me say this, we're Americans first and Christians second. And when you guys want me to stop saying that, then I will see a large percent of Christians saying, hmm, I have a brother. He thinks America is the greatest country it's ever been. I don't. I can still find the love that brother and respect him and honor him and esteem him and Philippians 2, 3, and 4 him. Even though I strongly disagree with him, I'll consider him as better than me, esteem him more highly than myself, even though I disagree with his view of America and how patriotic he is and vice versa. I've got a brother or a sister and they don't, seem to have a very high view of America. It bothers me. I think this is a great country and I don't think they'd want to live in such and such country. But you know what? I'm going to love that brother and that sister. But I'm just talking about a pipe dream now because we too carnal for this stuff, Jim. We're Americans. And you know what Americans do? Our forefathers taught us how to live. They taught us to be rebellious, fighters, my way of the highway, and independent. So I don't have a lot of hope for that, except if you're in a monolithic church. So if you, if you want peace, go to a monolithic church. If you're white, go to a white church. And make sure it's a white church that's kind of like you. And if you're black, go to a black church. And if whatever you, if you're older, go to a church for people. Just go and, and get around people, and you'll never debate over this. Man, I, I have a general follow-up to that that would be a good one to close out on, but I did get an anonymous uh, question, um, something that we dealt with in the last forum on election, but I do think that it is this is tied into this Christian nationalism that we talked about. Uh, the question says, uh, it starts with a statement, then there's a question. Pastor John MacArthur stated that true Christians will vote Republican. Is that being divisive and shouldn't he be warned? And again, I know we kind of dealt with a lot of that in our last forum on election, and I encourage you all to go back and uh, look at that in terms of who Christians have to vote for and not vote for and all that. I think Pastor Mike addressed that really good. But I do think this is related to this idea of Christian nationalism. So, Pastor Mike, could you speak on that? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of you guys know John MacArthur is, is, was like my first spiritual father, so I have great respect for him. And he, that was the first man I ever heard preach. And I'm thankful. And uh, he's, a, he's an amazing Bible teacher and a preacher and a great guy. Love him to death. Um, you know, I've gotten older. I'm no longer his little kid. I'm an older kid. So we have our disagreements. Um, I would never say anything like that <laughs> because I think it's 
uh, irresponsible. I hate to say that about John MacArthur, but it's, it's, it's spiritually irresponsible. He should not have said that, in my opinion. Um, I understand why he says it, because if you're given two choices, he's thinking, hey, if we got 10 boxes that matter morally, the Republicans line up on five or six of them, the Democrats only hit one of them, eh, it's a done deal, it's a moral issue, you gotta vote Republican because that's the moral side. Uh, something along those lines with the argument. Um, but, um, you know, read the statement again, Pastor Jeremy. Pastor John MacArthur stated that true Christians will vote Republican. Is that being divisive and shouldn't he be warned? Right. So whether he should be, you know, who should warn him is his own pastors and his own flock. But again, there's a lot of monolithic ism at Grace Community Church. I know I was there for a decade. Most people think like John, he's done a good job discipling them. So nobody gonna warn him because <laughs> they agree with him. But when you say true Christians should vote Republican, let's exegete this. True Christians. No, okay. True Christians, as opposed to fake Christians. Should. This is should moral. Yeah. Should vote Republican. Okay. All right. So um, I, 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 I'm, I was raised in the world of political debate. You know, there's Democrats in this country that are pro-life. And they don't do the whole LGBTQ thing. Like, they don't, they're not for that. Like, they're like pro-life, pro-marriage. They're not pro-gay. They're Democrats. So see, you see what happens when you say true Christians should vote Republican. I understand why he's saying that, but it's a it's 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 not a wise statement. It's really not. And I and I see his heart, and I understand he has passion. And as I've said to you before, until someone on this call or someone else has started a pregnancy center, because everyone always brings up abortion, you can't say anything to me because I've started one. <laughs> We've invested in it for over twenty years. So don't give me the pro life movement because very few people are more invested in pro life than me. So I know all about that. That's a grieving sin. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 is it divisive? It can be if you care. John MacArthur's a grain of sand on the beach. He's gonna die someday. So are you. <laughs> oh well. Um, so I love John. He's a great guy. Um, I would still tell people to listen to John MacArthur because he's a great Bible teacher. Um, and uh, there's a few things he says. There's a few things I say that are dumb, too. So just don't overreact to it. And it's not that big of a deal. You know something? Uh, you know what social media has done? It has made us think. It has made us lose sight of the idea that we're part of a local assembly. We all think we belong to every assembly. Let me rephrase that so I'm more accurate and more judicious. Many of us begin to think that when a prominent pastor says something, it should mean something to us. I don't care. Not my pastor. <laughs> if Jeremy Dixon said something like that, well, I'd have to get five or six guys because he's bigger than all of us, but we'd pin him down eventually. We pin them down, right? Because Jeremy Dixon's one of my pastors. I care. John MacArthur, eh, that's Grace Community. They're in California. They got bigger things to worry about. Let, let them deal with that. What is, I hear Jesus saying when he said to, to, you remember when he said to Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm not overly concerned. I had a guy call me and he said, uh, after, um, everything that happened at the Capitol building and all those types of things, he said uh, that he felt like the need to speak on the issue. And uh, I just tried to encourage him that the church is different than a news network. We don't speak on current events because that's our moral obligation. Nowhere in scripture is a church commanded to speak on current events. We are commanded to preach the word of God. So, 
Uh, I think it's along the same veins. That's a long answer to all that, but it gives you some of my thoughts on that. Love John, respect Tim. Really do respect John. John's a beast. Love that guy. He's taught, he taught me most of what I know. Taught me how to think. He's great with the scriptures. I think that's an unwise statement, though. It's an absolute that I think he could not back up biblically. He tried, but he couldn't. And check out our thing on uh, when we did on voting, because I really believe we tried to give, give you some really good principles for voting. And again, um, some people like John would disagree, but I think they're disagreeing with scripture and they would have to lift voting out of a Christian liberty issue and make it a moral thing. And you just can't do that from scripture because for something to be moral, it has to be commanded or prohibited. And voting's not. All right? It's neither commanded or prohibited. So careful about things that aren't perhaps per, 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 uh, commanded or prohibited saying should. Should's a, should's a mighty firm moral word. Well, Pastor Mike, uh, my last question is, what should the church do? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, Pastor Mike, uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Man, I just wanted to close out on this question, seeing as there are no other questions at this time. I want to go ahead and close out by asking, man, how can the church be salt and light in the midst of all this nationalism uh, that we see? Because obviously, if, you know, if you go this way to the right, well, this crowd over here, you're, you're not Christian enough. And if you go this way to, well, this crowd over here, well, you're not Christian at all. Man, well, how can the church go about being salt and light in the midst of uh, the nationalism that we see going on in our nation right now? That's a great question, Pastor Jeremy. Um, uh, the hardest thing I think for us to do is to love people. And I think when people don't vote the way we think they should and they don't align themselves with the right parties and stuff like that, it's just really easy when they support candidates that we don't like or we think are messed up or whatever. Um, you know, when you think about Christians as you think about Jesus and you think about the early church and, and all their imperfections and you think about how unique they were, what made them unique? What really made them unique? Um, they lived differently in many ways than most of the world. You know, when you read about Acts and you see all the poverty in the church and you see people selling their homes and all this stuff and bringing money to the church to make sure people have enough money to buy, people aren't doing that today. You know, Luke 6, love your enemies. It's like Jesus never even said that. It's amazing. It's amazing to me. So you want to be salt and light? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those. Be kind to those who mistreat you. You'd be salt and light, all right. You'll be real salt and light. I can't believe you didn't unfriend such and such because blah, 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 blah. Jesus said, love your enemies. That person's not my enemy. They just have a different political view than me. You'll be salt and light. Oh, you're just a da 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 da. Then you pray for that person who's persecuting you. <laughs> there is a tremendous desire, Pastor Jeremy, to belong. And in America, a stronger desire than belonging is to be right. <laughs> you combine wanting to be right and wanting to win, and you can get a real distorted Christianity really fast. Salt and light means. I'm a peculiar people. We are aliens and strangers. We kind of don't look like we belong here. What makes us look like that is we do stuff that nobody else does, like love our enemies. That's what we do. We pray for our president no matter who he or she is, consistently, by name. Why are you praying for him? He's a, he's a this. He, that's my president. The Bible says to pray. Like, that's what we do. We're peculiar people. So you want to be salt and light? Just start living out the tenets of the gospel and watch how strange and how much of an alien you become. You will truly be salt and light if you do that. Love your enemies. 
and love your brothers and sisters and don't grow weary in well-doing. You'll be salt and light for sure in this, in this context. And especially when it comes to nationalism, love people who, who say they love this country more than anything else, who are in the Capitol, uh, calling down Jesus's name, figure out how you're going to love those people. You can tell them the truth as it is in Jesus, but figure out how you're going to love them and, and, and love the people who hate them and tell them the truth. Um, it seems so impossible, but that's, that's the context. That's the time that God has us in. And I fear that um, most of us have just picked which team we're going to be on. And we're packing up our Christianity in our bags and we're moving to wherever that team is rather than saying our Christianity can't be contained in bags. It can't be contained in political parties. It transcends all that. If the world does not want to kill you, you're probably too much like the world. If the world's not scratching their head going, how could you love those people? I mean, yeah, you told them the truth, but then you're, you, I don't know what kind of Christianity you got. Like, we need to do some work. So we got a great opportunity in front of us. The whole world's falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's fighting. Everyone hates each other. Everyone's hoping for this person and that person. And this election was lost and these people cheated. And, ah, and they're all grasping for a salvation in total darkness. What an opportunity. Instead, what are we doing? We're right there with them fighting. <laughs> Our message isn't Jesus the son of the living God who was born and lived and died and raised again. Our message isn't the father so loved you to get. Our message is the Holy Spirit is not is here to help you. Our message is you're, we got it all wrong. Anyway, y'all get the gist. Well, Pastor Mike, man, thank you so much for your time. I want to thank everyone who joined in on the call. Thank you for your time as well. Appreciate it. Hope you were enlightened. Hope you learned something that you take away and use and, and apply uh, in the days and weeks ahead, especially as we continue to deal with uh, this idea of nationalism and Christian nationalism uh, in our church. Just want to remind you that uh, we are going to get this form out to you. Uh, we do take it and format it and everything. That's why it takes us a little time. Uh, we chop off the beginnings and the ends of people showing up early and leaving late and stuff uh, so that uh, it can be a good presentation. So if you will give us till Wednesday at noon, we're going to get that up on the website if you want to share that or if you want to watch it back again. And we want you to stay tuned for more forms. I've talked to Pastor Mike. I know he has some great ideas for some more things coming later in the year. So uh, stay tuned and listen out uh, because we're going to continue to do a few more of these uh, with uh, in, in the future. All right. Amen. Uh, with that said, Thank you so much, Pastor Mike, once again. And I'm going to ask you, brother, if you have any closing words. And if not, uh, if you do, that's fine. Please give them to us. If not, would you close us out in prayer? Uh, may God keep you. May he give peace. Uh, may, he, may he make us all Esthers. And uh, we need Micaiahs. We need Micaiahs. What the Lord, my God, says, that only will I speak. May only the words of the Lord fall off of our lips in every circumstances, not our opinions, not our preferences, not our desires, only his words. May he cleanse us, may he forgive us, and, and may he empower us to take an opportunity of a lifetime while our nation is literally tripping over itself, raging. May the church be salt and light and give the world the only message, the only message that is able to save them and to bring any peace of this world. That's my prayer, that's my hope. The Lord bless you and keep all of you. See you guys next time. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Thank you everyone, grace and peace.